Thank you, friends. I take that very warm welcome as a bit of a glint that might have reflected on me for being associated with the House of Justice for all those years. And we were all very loving and devoted to the House of Justice, and that's a, th a thrill and a lovely way to start this evening. Uh, friends, obviously, my remarks tonight are only personal reflections and in no way authoritative, except in that you might confirm some of the things along the way in your own Baha'i studies, in your readings, and in your own, own thoughts. I think that this is a very inspiring theme and learning and action that goes right back uh, as uh, has been suggested by the title here this evening, The Ocean of Revelation, being the dyna dynamic source of all of our learning. And as we uh, progress through this, I'm very pleased that the theme of love has been touched on here. I think, you know, when you go back to the origins of everything, including the beautiful singing that we had at the beginning, love is right there. I knew my love for thee, therefore I created thee. This is, this is you and me. He's created us and he's provided everything in creation for our training. I remember hearing when I was a new Baha'i, not from, not from the Baha'is, but strangely enough from Walt Disney in a film that was called The Adam and Us, uh, that the scientists had discovered that in magnitude of size, the human being was exactly in the middle between the smallest atom and the greatest colossal figures in space. In other words, God has extended reality from our, from our central position, both below us and above us, into this magnitude of uh, experience and um, kingdoms in which we can learn from. Also very pleased to be taking, taking part in a uh, conference dedicated to the memory of Hushman Fatih Zah. That's a, uh, you know, the next world gets all the treasures in the end. <laughs> but we have to sustain losses, which we do, in the course, individually and collectively. But I think that... Um, the passing of dear Hushman is a, is a very significant event. And he was so eager to go. He had a couple of close calls just within the last weeks, last months, and uh, was complaining that he hadn't been able to escape. <laughs> so I think he was quite pleased to go. And as I understand, he had this wonderful encounter with the youth at the Vancouver Conference, and then from there went directly to the hospital and slipped away. Uh, as I was sitting here this evening hearing the message of the House of Justice again, I recalled that uh, Shoghi Effendi had, in several messages to the East, talked about the reception that teachers of the faith, great teachers of the faith, receive when they enter the, the next world. And he describes scenes such as the, as the soul ascends into the center of the supreme concourse, the hosts on high rush forth from their habitations with joy and exaltation and chalices of light cheering the arrival of the, the new soul to their, to their marvelous array of spiritual life and the influence that they have on us. And I'm sure Hushman is enjoying those delights can only imagine in the next world. And for that we all struggle and strive, that we might serve in such a way that we could receive the blessings and bounties of God in the next world. Is that still working? Are you still? Uh, the concept of the ocean of revelation, I think, is one we're all familiar with and certainly very closely related to our own understanding and learning and illumined knowledge. Ocean, immerse yourself in the ocean of my revelation is the uh, commanding phrase of Baha'u'llah. And you see it in the uh, various tablets and in 
the Kitabi Akdas itself, he relates this ocean to those learned ones in Baha. He says, Happy are ye, O ye the learned ones in Baha. By the Lord, ye are the billows of the most mighty ocean, the stars of the firmament of glory, the standards of triumph waving betwixt earth and heaven. This uh, particular passage was interpreted by Shoghi Effendi uh, when he was asked about it. It's from the Kitabi Akdas, as I mentioned. And he said that it refers, the learned ones refers to two groups of uh, Baha'is. On the one hand, you have the hands of the cause of God, and the other, learned scholars and servants of the cause that are distinguished. And on that basis, the House of Justice had developed the theme of the counselors and created boards of counselors. But the House has several times indicated that, that the, the range of this second group of, of scholars is not limited to the appointed counselors, but there are, of course, other outstanding scholars in the world. And so that we see this uh, reference as ye are the billows of the most mighty ocean as a reference to those who have plunged themselves into the depths of the, of the ocean of Baha'u'llah's knowledge and share it and um, reflect it in their services to mankind and their services to the faith. Once again, he talks, uh, Abdu'l-Bahá speaks in, in uh, his writing, The Secret of Divine Civilization. He makes a reference to the learned ones in these words. There are those famed and accomplished men of learning, possessed of praiseworthy qualities and vast erudition, who lay hold on the strong handle of the fear of God and keep to the ways of salvation. In the mirror of their minds, the forms of transcendent realities are reflected, and the lamp of their inner vision derives its light from the sun of universal knowledge. I think these friends, these are the models of where do we get the inspiration for all of those things we want to carry into action from the revelation. The theme of, a, a, again, Baha'u'llah refers to the billowing ocean of God's utterances. And you'll remember from, the pray, from one of the prayers, make of my prayer a light that will lead me unto the ocean of thy presence. Looking more closely to some of the quotations about the ocean, it refers to Baha'u'llah referring to himself as the ocean. And certainly the ocean of his presence is his presence. And uh, I think that he says we should immerse ourselves in this ocean in whose depths lay the pearls of wisdom and utterance. And he calls it an ocean that surgeth in my name the all-merciful. And certainly it is the great bounty of the word of God itself that constitutes this ocean to which we're invited to. Again, he says, take thou thy portion of the ocean of his grace and deprive not thyself of the things which lie hidden in its depths. And again, were ye to discover the hidden, the shoreless oceans of my incorruptible wealth, ye would have a certainty esteem as nothing the world, nay, the entire creation. The theme of the ocean itself connects very beautifully with the variety of living waters mentioned in the, in the, in the writings. Quite a, a, a subject just in itself. Maybe someone will address that in the course of future activities. He says we should attain to them. He talks about the conditions, the prerequisites for attaining to living waters. And then he talks about the gifts and consequences of those who manage to attain those living waters. And the living waters, as you know, are the knowledge the waters of knowledge of water, of knowledge, of love, of grace and mercy, so on, in so many descriptions of these. 
From all of this, we are supposed to bring to the surface and share with others pearls of, the, of these divine treasures that are in the writings. Uh, if um, you have this lovely complexity in the writings of the word of God being, on the one hand, the speaking word of God, the manifestation of God amongst people, uttering his guidance and giving his, his teachings. And then you have the silent word of God, which is the repository of what he's already spoken of. And those, of course, uh, in his day were able to attain to both. We have the bounty of, this, of the word of God that remains with us now, this repository of these pearls and, and holy treasures that we can, we can approach. And uh, this is a, something that in no way should we lament that we weren't present at the beginning, although that would be a great bounty, and I th hope that we will all attain to that in the next world. But... Both Baha'u'llah and elaborated by Abdu'l Baha and Shoghi Effendi refer to the fact that the power of the Word of God is released gradually. It's part of progressive revelation that the, the influence of the revelation is growing. Did Baha'u'llah ever attend a conference of this sort, of this many people, directing himself to his words, inspired by his prayers? You see how this thing is. This thing grows in the world, and it's wonderful. The uh, progressive release of the potentialities of the creative energies that are inherent in the words that he left with us. Uh, you know, living in the Holy Land for so many years, hearing stories from the old days, and having some connection with the archives of the faith. You come to, to understand certain things which weren't altogether uh, clear to me at the, at the beginning. One of them is the nature of revelation itself, of Baha'u'llah's, uh, the act of his revealing the words of God. Perhaps you'll recall in a passage that Shoghi Effendi has included in the gleanings that there are three proofs for the revelation. The first proof, the highest, the most exalted proof, is the manifestation of God himself, that such a creature exists, that he's been sent to the world. You know, the other day I was thinking, because I've been flying around a lot, as many of you do, you don't have to get very far off the ground before you can't see a human being. They just disappear. And yet this speck representing the most exalted kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, if you will, himself in his all-embracing reality, existed on earth. And most of his fellow human beings wanted to squash him and stop him. And yet, the influence of that miraculous point, think of the Bob calling himself the primal point and talking about the manifestation being the primal point and out of that point is generated everything. And at the same time, he says, this is like the point of the pen. The manifestation is the supreme pen, and his point is revelation. And it traces itself into innumerable shapes. And in those shapes are inherent the divine meanings that he's brought to mankind. So in that sense, he's, he's the supreme pen both by representing the word of God, but also by what issues forth from him. Baha'u'llah had the custom out of uh, consideration for the, for the believers who were visiting or around him uh, when he felt revelation, impelled to revelation because it would come impetuously on him. He would uh, dismiss the friends, he would excuse them. Sometimes he would excuse them very shortly after they arrived in his presence. And uh, this had uh, raised the curiosity of Ruhullah Varga's brother, who was with them, his father and his brother in the Holy Land. And he said he was very curious why Baha'u'llah sent, sent us away so quickly. And the explanation came from those who were more experienced that it's because the... Um, this is a moment when Baha'u'llah wants to reveal 
directly and that the force of the revelation is such that out of consideration and courtesy he dismisses the friends. He said, you know, I would really like to be present sometime when that's happening. And the family said, well, they would look into it and ask Baha'u'llah if it were possible. And several weeks passed and he was out playing around Bhaji and he got a call from to come upstairs that Baha'u'llah wanted to see him. So he came upstairs and they took him to the curtain that you know and the room of Baha'u'llah and they told him to step inside, Baha'u'llah has asked to see you. So he takes the curtain and he steps inside and he sees Baha'u'llah is walking, pacing in the room and chanting. And just as fast as he notices that, he feels his knees weakening under him and he starts to faint. And on his way down, he sees Baha'u'llah say, Hodaf is. <laughs> so the family, you know, being wise in these matters, reached under the <laughs> curtain and pulled him out and took him to another room and put rose water on him. He wanted to know, what happened to me? I, I just, as soon as I got there, I fainted. He said, you wanted to be present when Baha'u'llah was revealing. And that was a moment when he was revealing. Now, uh, during Vargo's visit, there was another occasion on which Baha'u'llah was with the, the men visitors who were there, and he took Varga, the eventual martyr, by the waist, and another believer by the waist, and started pacing up and down the room and began chanting. Everyone was overwhelmed with the power of the thing. Just briefly he did that, and then he excused himself and left their presence. And everyone said, did you feel that power? Did you feel the impact of that? Yes. And did you hear what he was saying? Yes. Does anybody remember what he said? No. <laughs> Nobody could remember anything about the content. They just knew the power of it. Mirza Aga John, who was, as you know, uh, Baha'u'llah's uh, amanuensis, secretary, companion, servant, he's left a few testimonies. He says that he, of course, had been given capacity from Baha'u'llah to, to, to do the revelation writing, to write down as quickly as he could. He says, I could only manage to note down one of every five verses. I couldn't get it down so quickly. The power that poured off of Baha'u'llah. And then he describes that he said, at times when Baha'u'llah was in the, the intensity of the revelation, he shone like the sun. Now, I don't, we don't know what the implications of that are, but that's a nice image. And he said that the words that he said, you would lose the meaning of them because they were like peals of thunder rolling off of Baha'u'llah and issuing out to the ends of the earth. Now, he would himself pass out and they'd have to come and <laughs> revive him. So it, he, was, he was very you know, industrious. He had to copy all these notes out onto another sheet because they were so brief to the best of his ability. Then he would sit with Baha'u'llah and Baha'u'llah would fill in the missing spots and do the corrections and so on. They'd be sent for it. He used to get quite tired doing all of this. He had a ponytail. He would sit next to the wall with his knees up on the floor with the paper on his knees writing and the ponytail was tied to a nail on the wall. So when he'd fall asleep, he would pull his hair <laughs> And he'd wake up and he'd go on. That was, this is, a, you know, in case the secretaries of the NSA need any kind of you know, <laughs> encouragement. <laughs> so we mentioned the speaking word, which is the manifestation when he's alive, and the silent word, what remains with us afterwards. The, um, this is quite a quite interesting uh, to think about you know we hear about is, is um, we hear about matter and energy the interchange between this and spirit and matter are very closely related in the same fashion we have parallels think of uh, Baha'u'llah receives the revelation a terrific spiritual impact on his reality and he then chants the verses of the revelation. 
We'll go into the nature of the revelation a little bit shortly, but he chants this, and that becomes now a sound wave. That sound wave goes into the ear of Aga John, and he creates even more material evidence of it by writing down the, the verses of God. Now the, these holy verses of God have become sound and they've become black markings on a page. Well and good. We, some century and a half later, pick up a book with black tracings in it hmm, and think about it and the spirit with which Baha'u'llah revealed that is present in those words. And it comes back to us then as spirit. Spirit to matter, matter to spirit again. It's quite an interesting concept, you think of it. And so much has been said by Shoghi Effendi and uh, uh, some of the things that I've written about light and darkness relate very directly to that, that these energies are latent in the words. The words have a power quite different from our words. And Baha'u'llah says, though they may be the most commonplace of words, they have creative energy. You remember from the book of Genesis, he says that the word of God does not return void to its maker. It has a power with it that adheres to it. And the Bob says, every verse of the lordly tree is accompanied by the creative energy to accomplish what's mentioned in that verse. Think about that when you say your obligatory prayers and read the prayers of the fast. It's all inherent in there for us if, if we become sensitive to it. There, there is something in, uh, in the explanations that we see in the writings, quite mysterious, that we have been, his, his image, his divine image has been engraved upon our inner nature. That we are, as Abdu'l-Bahá re- refers a number of times in his talks in the West, the image and likeness of God. We are the image and likeness of God. We are a reflection of that in the mirror of our own inner being. And yes, the mirror gets gummed up and the image gets distorted through that, warped and distorted, if you will. It has to be, we're constantly working to make it a clear image. But the point is, we are not the mirror. That's not the important part of us. It's the image that's projected in us. And the Bob declares in one of his passages, he said, that is... Your true being is that projected image and likeness of the names and attributes of God that constitutes your reality. This is a a terrific thing. And so related to this question of learning and knowledge, he says that if you come to understand that true inner reality of your own, that is the knowledge of God ordained by the manifestation for you. You see these mysterious passages where he says that the knowledge of me is the knowledge of thine own true self. It's totally mysterious. Now, on one hand, we've got the lower nature. We've got our animal nature, which is connected to us. And some of the writings imply that he's linked a devil to us to train us, you know, so to speak, to keep us alert. And we move from that very limited, uh, selfish point of view, we have to arise in service, gradually becoming more and more selfless till the quality of our servitude reaches its highest level. And the Bob relates this also in his writings. He says, this, is the, this servitude is what is the drawing close to God, the presence of God, if you will. And he says that, um, he quotes from one of the imams that, Servitude is a matter the essence of which is divinity. Now think of the implications of that for Abdu'l Baha's station, who is the model of servitude for us. How much he's filled with divinity because he moves away from self towards this selflessness, which is servitude, which is what God wants from us. And that's the point, if you will, the conjunction point where true being is related. 
And all through these various stages of new vision, we attain to further understanding of the revelation. Uh, uh, you've got the seven valleys as one stack of, of potential stages. You've got uh, the Bob saying that the eye, first the material eye, has to be opened for the attainment of understanding and knowledge of God. And then he says the spiritual eye, and then the intellectual eye, and that's a more universal intellectual eye, not intellect in the sense of common Western understanding. And then the highest one, he says, the fourth stage of vision is the inner heart. Um, for the Persian friends, the fuad, the eye of fuad, the inner reality. And he says only that highest degree understands the deeper meanings of divine unity and the implications of what the, what the faith really stands for. So we have this number of, of grades and Bob says also in one of his passages about the revelation, the word of God, he says that every uh, verse, every word, every letter of revelation has torrents of divine meanings flowing in it and around it and from it. And as we advance in our own levels of vision, then fresh meanings, sometimes meanings that have never been born again, virgin meanings. And Baha'u'llah relates this to the Huris. He says, these are the Huris that you will attain when you go to paradise. I'm afraid some of the Muslims are going to be a bit disappointed about the <laughs> giving their lives for the 70 virgins, you know, and they find out that these are secret meanings of the divine texts <laughs> to the great joy of the spiritual minded, but not to the, uh, some of the lower aspirations of man. Uh, the scope of the revelation, just a few words about this. Uh, before I left the Holy Land, uh, you know, the writings generally have been uh, put into computer form, digitized. So we're able to count the number of words of the revelations of both the Bab and Baha'u'llah. Now, I, I'm not sure of the total number of the revelations of all the past scriptures together, but it is clear that the Bob's revelation surpasses the combined scriptures of all ages that we have any record of. And that comes to five million words of revelation from the Bob. Now you say, well then, what's left for Baha'u'llah? Baha'u'llah has revealed in our present record, and surely there, there are still more tablets that arrive that families have, have uh, not shared necessarily or are not known about and then are discovered later on. We have six million words from Baha'u'llah. This is so, it, he outdoes the Bab and then all those previous revelations as well. The supreme manifestation of God. The question of uh, organizing that knowledge thematically is one that uh, is being considered now, and I see that on one of the parts of the program there's some thoughts about that. There are hidden themes that are not the words that are in the text, but the def definition of things that are definitely identifiable, and how to, how to do that and how to automate it so that the House of Justice has on it, at call all of the implications of any subject that may come before it. And that eventually, friends, we would have the same thing. Now we have some programs like Ocean and Search programs which bring up a lot of information for us as we consider the implications of these various verses. Uh, back to the subject that, that the torrents of meanings that pour through the verses and the words and the um, individual letters of the words. And you, perhaps you'll recall an example of this in the end of the Seven Valleys where Baha'u'llah talks about a bird and he mentions the letters of the bird and each letter stands for certain things. Uh, this is very common in the revelation of the Bab. He takes 
the individual letters of a word, and he said that, okay, and this letter means this, and this letter means this, and this. There's the commentary on the Surah of Kosar of the Bab. The Surah of the Kosar is a Quranic Surah with three verses. And in that uh, commentary, which is revelatory commentary, as he makes clear at a later stage, he describes the meaning of the of the whole surah together, then he describes the meaning of each sentence of the surah, then of each word of the surah, and finally of each letter of each word of every verse of the surah. 750 page commentary that the Bob writes. It just pours out of him. So he says that this, this is the meanings of, of those divine words are there, and then he adds on, he says, these meanings all have hidden meanings. And he describes again all these things. He says, these have their hidden meanings. Then he says, and these hidden meanings have mysterious, unseen meanings. Okay, so we've got one set of meanings, and we have another set of meanings, and we have another set of meanings. Then he names two more, and then he finally says, etc. <laughs> My God. Is it any wonder, friends, that sometimes you come up with a meaning of a verse of God different from the one I come up with? And is there any harm in it? If we're moving at different levels, say, say that you were looking at a parade. There was a gorgeous parade, and you were standing on the street, and you saw these lovely floats and things in front of you, and you observed them, and they had a certain meaning to you. But then you were invited up in the building, and you began to see more of the parade. And finally, you get to the top, you see the whole parade. There's no contradiction. There's no need for us ever to have a conflict about the meaning of the words of God. In fact, Baha'u'llah warns us against such a thing. That doesn't mean that every meaning we come up with is necessarily a true meaning. But it does allow for a great variety of understanding. You know, maybe I'm seeing with the eye of the spirit and you're seeing with the eye of the intellect. And she's seeing with the eye of the inner eye of God. So you see different meanings in the same thing. And it also means that you can't do the writings one time. There were some pilgrims in the Holy Land, and Shoghi Effendi asked them at the table if they had read the, and studied the Kitab Gan. And one of the men, I'm sorry to say from North America, said, yes, he'd done it. <laughs> and Shoghi Effendi didn't say anything. But the next group of pilgrims, they said, when he was there, Shoghi Effendi raised this question again. He said that the man had, from North America said that he'd done it. He said, you can't do it. It's no end to it. It's an endless study. And when you look at his instructions with regard to, again, this revelation, he says to read and reread. In the different letters, you put them all together, you get a kind of a scheme. He says, read, reread, delve. Uh, painstakingly study the writings of the faith. And then he says, he moves on from there and he says, to digest their content of the holy books, the principal holy books, digest it. And then he says, and after that you should master its contents in such a way that you can deliver it faithfully to others. And finally, he says, the capstone of all, he says, you should memorize characteristic passages, make them your own. My own impression, friends, and I think this is a good setting to, to talk about it, is that we haven't done what Shoghi Effendi said about studying and mastering the essential books of our revelation. Now, th this is in no way meant to be a competition with the, the courses of study that we have in the study circles. The Ruhi books are there. Uh, there may be those who think that they've studied the faith sufficiently. They don't need to study the Ruhi books. That's not the point. The point is you would want to know their contents because you're guiding others into such a system. And you would be wise to be familiar with everything that's there. But beyond that, beyond that collective responsibility that you have in the community, you have an individual responsibility to Baha'u'llah to act on that command, immerse yourself in the ocean of my revelation and bring up the pearls. So many things to be discovered, no end to it. The... Um,
The last thing that I wanted to mention a bit here is the identification of various modes of divine revelation. This theme you'll see comes in the writings of the Bab and also you will have noticed perhaps in this Re Heikal, the tablet of the temple, Baha'u'llah speaks about revealing his own revelation in nine modes, nine different styles, nine different forms. This had been mentioned in Islam. There are four modes of revelation mentioned in Islam. The Bab defines those more clearly, elaborates them, and adds a fifth one. And he says that, the, that these modes of revelation first are the divine verses themselves, the voice of divinity. And that would be characterized by the phrase, I am God, which comes through the revelation when the manifestation speaks in the first person. And Baha'u'llah, of course, has explained with caveats in the, in the Igon itself what he means by that is the complete selflessness of the manifestation to the degree that God uses him to speak in the first person to us. The second stage of mode of revelation is uh, the mode of prayers. And this is the mode characterized by the phrase, Thou art God. First I am God, then thou art God. Then commentaries and then additional treatises and documents are the other two. And those are characterized by he is God. He is God who does this and does that and so on. So you have this, uh, all of these modes of the way the manifestation addresses us. Then uh, the Bob says this is all, these are all in Arabic. And he adds those same modes in the Persian language. And he said that's the fifth mode that he adds. Baha'u'llah in the Heikal says nine modes. He has nine modes he's revealing in. And then in a separate document he says all nine modes are in the Surya Heikal. Which in the, the collective Surya Heikal means the tablets to the kings and rulers as well as the initial documentation. If you, It's almost like Baha'u'llah explains who he is, establishes his credentials in the, in the tablet of the temple, and then he goes on to the kings to tell them what they should do as a result of understanding who he is. So he addresses Napoleon and the Pope and the others. Quite, quite, quite interesting. Everybody's curious to know what are the nine modes of revelation of Baha'u'llah. We, we don't have any indication of them except Haji Mirza Haider Ali has written a diary and he mentions the Lohi no Shaun, the, the Shan, the nine modes of revelation. He says the tablet of the nine modes of revelation, which he's seen, but so far nobody's come up with it. I think we're pretty close to understanding that by some of the verses of Baha'u'llah where he says, at times I reveal in the voice of a mystic and other times in the voice of a lawmaker. And Shoghi Effendi in several instances in his summaries, in God Passes By, mentions a whole list of that Baha'u'llah revealed prayers and homilies and commandments and laws and so on. You can look up those lists. Basically, there are more than nine there and uh, contemplate that amazing array of kinds of revelation. Um, we know that the, the basis of all, of all of these is to infuse into the world the potentialities to attain to maturity, the like of which it hasn't seen yet. And it's uh, in the writings of Shoghi Effendi, the, the coming of the creative forces or powers released through the successive revelations of the Bab and Baha'u'llah. He says this is infusing into mankind the potentialities of all those developments that have to have to take place. We mentioned earlier, nothing is revealed that doesn't have the power of accomplishment attached to it. Uh, this has a, this has a, a, a very uh, rather intense flip side to it, that the word of God goes out, if it's embraced, it cr recreates the recipient. The individual is, is lifted up by it. If the word of God goes out and it's negated, or it's attacked in any way, it turns to fire. The light turns to fire. And that's the disintegration that's happening all around us in the world, is the rejection of Baha'u'llah's teachings, 
Now, sometimes it happens at a very simple level, but the Bob says, you know, okay, if you ignore it, that's one level. But if you attack it, that's a whole other matter. And, uh, of course, we're going to see, uh, as the power of the faith extends itself, we're going to see more attacks on the cause. The, uh, this infusion, then, is followed by the, in the heroic age of the faith and the earliest period of the faith is followed in the next stage by the diffusion of the divine light that's revealed, is infused through the revelation itself. It's, it's in a state of pregnancy at that. Then Abdu'l-Bahá calls for its diffusion and he gives the divine plan and he says all the places that the light of God should be diffused. And Shoghi Effendi then celebrates that in a number of passages where he says during this formative age of the faith, uh, we formative Baha'is have been carrying the light of God, diffusing it over the face of the earth. But he refers to another stage of the influence of the divine revelation as suffusion. So we have infusion, diffusion, and suffusion. More connected with the golden age of the faith, more connected with the light first spreads itself over all the face of the earth, and now it's beginning to arrive at the stage where it penetrates into the life of societies. The influence of it then starts transforming not just random individuals but masses of people and finally the governing nature and character of the faith and its services has, has to make itself evident. So this is the final stage then of the meaning of this learning that we're going through is to bring us from diffusion of the faith, individual teaching and so on into another process of suffusion where the influence of Baha'u'llah's teachings penetrates the realities of sciences and organizations and activities. Fortunately, we're not alone. There are passages from the Guardian that say that the mankind, uh, there are organizations unconscious of Baha'u'llah's revelation which are acting on these same energies. And any group of, ma of people, individuals, that support or uh, champion one of Baha'u'llah's laws or teachings in some, so, some sort, receive the whole energy of the revelation behind them. It's a, thrill, it's a thrilling process. We're not alone. These two, the unconscious development of the lesser peace and of all of those things and our own building of the administrative order through the processes generated by these creative energies, which are the processes of the administrative order, they crystallize in consciousness. They enter into the actions of agencies, which are the joint connecting of all of us who have been illumined by the process of the revelation, and bring forth these stages, and bring forth agencies such as the Association of Baha'i Studies, where the whole thing is looked at into the future. Well, friends, you've been very patient. I'm happy, so happy to have had these moments with you at the beginning of the conference and I wish you great success in your deliberations and your discoveries and bring up the pearls and show us the, the goods. Thank you.